ladies and gentlemen, we have quorum, and so uh, we are now past the uh, appointed time of our committee meeting, our subcommittee meeting. So, uh, Madam Clerk, are there any changes to the agenda? Yes, good morning, Mr. Mayor, members of the committee. There are two changes. They are added pieces of correspondence. The first is correspondence from Matt Jelly respecting a casino location, and the second is correspondence from Reverend Alan Gerard on behalf of the Churches of the Ancaster Ministerial Association expressing their opposition to any proposals to bring a casino into downtown Hamilton. This correspondence was referred by Council last evening to the subcommittee today. Thank you. They, they, they can be discussed under general information. All right. So a motion to approve the agenda is amended. Councillor Marula, Councillor Pasuda, all in favor? Carried. And any declarations of interest? Seeing none, members of the committee, you have before you the minutes from November 30th, uh, the meeting of the subcommittee. Are there any questions? With okay, move, Suda, Marula, all in favor? That's carried, thank you. And uh, discussion items, Councillor. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, and on the discussion items, we're now focusing on item 4.1, which is related to the health and social impacts. Dr. Richardson is here, and I wanna thank her uh, for being in attendance. I, I do have a, a couple of issues, only because I think it's vital that, um, I, as I've mentioned in the past, that we incorporate the public health concerns um, and we mold it into the direction of where this casino is headed and if indeed we even, uh, even support a casino in the long run. Having said that, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, in dealing with the addiction issue in itself, I think it's important that we focus in on trying to create awareness regarding what addiction is, how it plays a role in gambling, and how it plays a role in making this decision, um, it, not only now but in the future, if for whatever reason we support a casino, why proximity might matter, why even supporting a casino and the continuation of a casino matters. So through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, to Dr. Richardson, um, with respect to uh, addiction. What exactly is an, addi an addiction, and can you separate the physical addiction to that of behavioral addictions? For you, Mr. Mayor, I'm going to ask uh, Susan Boyd, who's actually our expert in addictions from Wonderful. the Alcohol, Drug, and Gambling Program. All right, thank you. Through you, Chair. Um, so those are all very good questions. And so when we look at addictions, there is a difference between sort of substance use addictions and problem gambling. And problem gambling is known more as a process addiction. But so it certainly has been recognized that there can be addictive factor to gambling. And it is um, within the DSM, it is a recognized sort of mental um, disorder. Uh, if you use sort of more of a medical term. And we do know that there's many different ways that people can sort of pathways into somebody becoming addicted to gambling. Okay. And when you're looking at a, a substance abuse addiction versus that of a behavioral addiction, the, the actual difference would be the withdrawal process, so the physical addiction versus the psychological addiction. Is that correct to you, Mr. Mayor? Through the chair, there certainly can be differences related to withdrawal. Um, some people will talk about withdrawal issues with, from problem gambling when they stop. It's a little bit different than a substance use addiction. And I think the other um, way, and they're just starting to do research into this, is looking at how sort of from a biological sort of brain point of view it works, but they are finding that there are similar pathways between sort of substance use addictions and problem gambling. Okay, so through you, Mr. Mayor, with respect to the actual physical addiction, how long does the withdrawal period last? approximately two weeks. For you, Chair, um, is that for problem, can I clarify, is that for problem gambling? For substance abuse. For substance use, that actually depends on the substance that somebody's using, and it also depends on sort of, sort of how long and how much they've used. On average, uh, for the physical on, abuse? Sure, on average, uh, through you, Chair, it can go anywhere from sort of 24 hours up until sort of 10 days or a bit more. Right. Yeah. Okay, and to you, Mr. Mayor, with respect to a psychological addiction, that's a lifetime battle, is it not, through you, Mr. Mayor? Through the chair, um, there's differing sort of opinions on that. I think it depends on which model of addiction people follow. So there certainly is a disease model, 
um, and people will believe that it's lifelong. And then there's other models that would indicate that when people receive treatment, that they can actually sort of overcome addictions. They still need to watch for high risk situations, but it doesn't mean that they're sort of addicted for. Okay. And to you, Mr. Mayor, with respect to uh, the process of addiction, I, I presume there's the, the experimental, habitual, impulsive, and then, and then really the compulsive component to the addiction process. And if we're dealing with a casino as an example uh, issue, uh, the proximity question of, of if, you have a, if you have a group of individuals, obviously the probability is going to increase that the larger the, the group, the larger we're going to have participation. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Susan. Would that be a, a fair conclusion? Fair. Um, so just again to clarify, so you're asking if there's sort of greater accessibility, availability of gambling, then you <coughs> get a higher prevalence rate? Right. So the more density of, of people, the increased probability of use or, or participation. Chair, so what the evidence has shown is that with higher availability of gambling, you do tend to get higher participation in gambling. Doesn't necessarily equate to more problem gamblers, but they have also found in quite a few studies that when you increase that base um, of people who are problem gambling, that you can get an increased prevalence of problem gambling. But it's a very complex, there's many things that go into it, but proximity and availability has certainly been environmental factors that they think can influence problem gambling rates. Okay. Now, and to you, Mr. Mayor, recognizing that addiction uh, transcends economic social uh, variables, has there been any studies or in your opinion, if, if you are going to uh, ha subject uh, a lower social economic uh, density or, or individuals, would those people be far more vulnerable uh, to participating in that activity than than in a higher socioeconomic uh, area. Through you, Mr. Mayor, when you look at the issues between the, the, the um, relationship between socioeconomic status and gambling, there's evidence that for those who have lower education, there seems to be higher rates of, of problem gambling amongst those individuals. For those who have a lower income, you know, those being the two factors commonly thought of as parts of socioeconomic status. For those who have a lower income, the data is, is not so clear on there being a higher prevalence of problem gambling, but they're certainly more impacted. The impact of, uh, of problem gambling on the individuals and their families is greater because they tend to spend more of their income proportionately when they gamble. Okay, so through you, Mr. Mayor, um, I think that's what we heard there is it's, it's fairly important. Through you, there is a correlation between level of education and income, though. Uh, would you concur with that? Through you, Mr. Mayor, yes. Okay. So, and through you, did you also emphasize the fact that uh, they are far more vulnerable or susceptible as a direct result of that, those two issues? Sorry, could you repeat the question? I didn't hear at the beginning. That from the uh, economic um, social perspective, that the most vulnerable that fall into those categories, lower education, lower income, would be more susceptible and more, uh, there would be a significant more impact on them as a result of those two variables. Through you, Mr. Mayor, it's, um, it's complex. Some seem to be more susceptible, some not. The impact definitely seems to be higher. Okay. With respect uh, to you, Mr. Mayor, um, to the other public health issues surrounding suicide, suicide. Um, could you just elaborate based on your report? You had mentioned uh, significant um, information or, or referenced and quoted numbers. Could you just briefly, in a brief synopsis on your perspective and understanding of how there's a correlation between problem gambling, casino proximity to, uh, to people and that of suicide rates? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The issue of um, the relationship with problem gambling and mental health is, is one that's well studied and, and overall with mental health there's a correlation between um, problem gambling and poorer mental health and that covers a number of issues from depression, anxiety, um, uh, all the way through other uh, issues include suicide. So when you look at the issue of suicide, um, some of the data suggests that about 40% of problem gamblers report suicidal thoughts and about 20% um, had suicide attempts. Um, the worrying thing is those rates are even higher amongst youth um, in terms of suicide attempts. 
When it comes to actually completing suicide, which of course would be um, the most unfortunate outcome, it's harder to, um, the studies aren't as clear on those. There certainly appears to be an impact in communities that have had casinos, particularly, an increased number of completed suicides as well. But it's harder to estimate the number that are going to, that correlate to the uh, those who uh, have attempts. Okay. And um, through you, um, Mr. Mayor, with respect to uh, other mental, uh, other issues surrounding uh, f family issues, um, other issues related to addictions, um, ex have we incorporated those aspects into the study at all? So in essence, family relationships, uh, abuse scenarios, um, th those, those types of variables. Through you, Mr. Mayor, I'll begin and then I'll just turn it over to Susan because she sees these issues every day okay. through our clinic. But when you look at, at gambling, it's not just the individual who is impacted. Certainly, there's concern at the individual level, but the impact extends beyond to their family members, friends, and of course to the broader community. So when we think about family, we're thinking about financial issues particularly that affect the individual and then can affect their broader family, relationship issues. Um, when you're talking about addictions issues, you get into lying and uh, and the consequences that go along with that. There's issues around um, bankruptcies and their effect on the community more broadly, issues on it around employment, um, people being um, absent from work uh, due to gambling and gambling-related consequences. So I'll just turn to Susan to add anything she may have from her perspective in the, in the clinic. Chair, um, so we do, as part of our clinic, we actually see both individuals who have a problem with gambling, but we'll also see family members or friends who have been impacted, and we certainly do see the impacts, I think a lot of which Dr. Richardson covered. And I think it, it can be tough for family members because it's often a hit, what we call a hidden addiction, and so often family members don't become aware until it becomes quite an issue. So there's financial of looking at either unable to pay rent or possibly mortgage. Sometimes for older adults who are affected, it's retirement savings that have been um, sort of gambled away. And so, and also we know for that with children, there can be an impact, again, related to the finances around issues of poverty, um, again, around housing, food security. Sometimes kids, you know, become very concerned about parents, and so even going to school, they're distracted. So it certainly can have an impact. And, and through you, Mr. Mayor, with respect to uh, the cost to the city, to the province, or to society as a whole, have we captured um, that impact um, with respect to cost as a direct result of all of these problems associated with problem gambling? Through you, Mr. Mayor, we didn't complete an economic analysis associated with this. Of course, in looking at the issue of, of casinos and gambling, you have to ideally look at it more broadly at the economic is issues and the economic consequences. We didn't do that as part of this report, and in the research we've done to date, uh, neither Susan nor I have come across that information, but certainly that would be something to consider. Okay, so at the appropriate time, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to move uh, that um, the staff be directed to actually formulate a, a report accordingly uh, with respect to the economic um, aspects, both negative and, and positive. Um, Another component, uh, with respect to some of the conditions uh, that I, I was actually happy to see, and a number of them we've discussed at our last meeting, the, the issue of, of tourism through you, um, Mr. Mayor, and, and casinos uh, came up. And in Hamilton, we all know that the vast majority of tourism is associated uh, with family members visiting their families. Um, and although that's, that's changing to some degree, uh, by far it's into the significant uh, percentage of people just visiting their families. So it, we're not in any way a, a tourist mecca, so we're going to be focusing in on, on our individual residents here. And I'm wondering, with the conditions of hours of operation, I know I brought it up at the last meeting, and, and Councillor, oh, sorry, Dr. Richardson concurred in a report, that that would be one of those mitigating issues. Through you, Mr. Mayor, I, I, I find when you look at, for instance, the addiction process of the experimental, habitual, the impulsive, the compulsive component, it, w how can we be targeting a tourist or entertaining anyone after 2 a.m.? Wouldn't that really be focusing in on those that are compulsive gamblers? I, I, I find that being open, after 2 a.m., I'm not sure how many people are actually trying to find, seek entertainment at that point, or even 3 a.m. for that matter. So through you, Mr. Mayor, when it comes to those, those operating hours, how important 
are those operating hours and ensuring that we try that we try to mitigate some of these issues regarding the compulsive nature of gambling. For you, Mr. Mayor, in terms of the operating hours, um, overall, when you look at, at interventions that have been looked at to date, um, the evidence shows that op that policies, operating policies, are one of the most effective in um, preventing problem gambling. And so the, the hours of operation, the reason for introducing those is really based on um, an idea of giving people a break from gambling. And so for the problem gambler to have a point where they stop, they get to reconsider what they're doing, um, think about, about how much they've gambled, how much they may have lost over that period of time, and reconsider whether it's something they want to continue, as opposed to ongoing continuous gambling where there's never that break. Now, with respect to, um, and lastly, I'll probably come back for more questions later, but with respect to the, the actual location of a casino, through you, Mr. Mayor, in all, everything that we've discussed regarding the, the addiction process, the, the code red issues, and, and how it affects um, low income as well as undereducated individuals, uh, our present location in, in Flamborough, um, through you, Mr. Mayor, have we seen a, a significant, in, in looking at our data, and this is something maybe I should have given you the heads up on, because it's something we can perhaps visit in the future, in tracking where the, our addiction assessment services and our gambling issues, where in the city those problems are presently located. So where that clientele is coming from. So through you, Mr. Mayor, do you have that, uh, is, that information available? If not, could we have that uh, added to a future, to a future meeting? There. Um, currently, we don't have um, those stats available as far as where we're getting people coming into our clinic, kind of which area they're living in. Um, it may be something that could be um, gained. I'm not sure. But we okay. can certainly look into that. Okay, because my, under my understanding is uh, just in your own database, and I know you have a database, is that through the postal codes you can track, you can track individuals via postal code and then map it out accordingly. Through the chair, we do um, collect um, postal codes if people are willing to give us that information, so it's probably something that we could look into. Wonderful. So at the appropriate time, if I could actually move that as well, uh, that, would be, that would be very helpful. And uh, lastly, with respect to a lot of the issues that, that uh, were presented here from a public health perspective, how much of those, or how many of those issues would be mitigated if you take the casino outside of the core and into its existing location in Flamborough. Through you, Mr. Mayor, we did we did look at some mapping to some preliminary um, information. We haven't done a more detailed analysis to look at where the socioeconomic um, socioeconomically more vulnerable groups and other vulnerable groups, because it's not only socioeconomic status that makes people more vulnerable to get to problem gambling. There's other factors: youth, males, seniors. Um, Aboriginal populations are all more more vulnerable to them. Um, in the, it, just from an overall population perspective, the data on proximity um, says that that the closer you are to the casino, the more likely you are to gamble. And there seems to be a higher rate of problem gamblers. There's that's not as clear. And so, the farther it, away it is from the population, and the po the postulation is as well that the more um, challenging it is to get to the uh, to the casino that there would be lower rates of both gambling and, and problem gambling. The studies that are there use um, boundaries like 16 kilometers and 50 kilometers. So when we were talking within the city of Hamilton, that that distance, um, you know, in Flamborough compared to downtown isn't as significant. Um, we get we've started to look at the vulnerable populations. They're fairly um, dispersed throughout the city on the stuff that we've done so far. And so to to say that we can move it away from a particular vulnerable population um, is challenging. Socioeconomic status in relation to the the areas that have been previously identified may be something that's a little clearer. But we'll uh, we can continue to look at those factors um, going forward. Okay, and then and through you. Um Ms. Mary, I think a lot of the what we've heard today is that there is a direct co correlation that really the bottom line is that proximity does matter. Um, so I'm wondering if, through you, Mr. Mayor, if, if Dr. Richardson 
if once you complete the economic impact report uh, and and you you incorporate some of the other issues surrounding where the existing presenting problems exist surrounding uh, problem gambling in the city, would it be would it be out of the question to take all of this into account and as the medical officer of health put forward a recommendation either for or against a casino? You, Mr. Mayor, just to clarify, from an economic standpoint, that's something that we wouldn't be able to complete an overall economic analysis of the impacts of a casino. In terms of the economic impacts of problem gambling, there's not a lot of good literature that we've been able to find out there. We can bring back what we would have. Um, we can look at those other factors in terms of um, the accessibility and the, the, the postal codes with the problem gambling situation. In terms of if your question was whether a casino well, should be here or not, if you were to look at a public health approach overall, and Toronto Public Health states this in their report as well, if you look simply from the health impacts of problem gambling, you might say no to a casino just on that basis. We appreciate that there's a broader perspective to be taken and we aren't equipped to do the broader economic analysis. My colleagues to the right are better equipped to, equipped to do that sort of analysis. And when you looked at all of those factors together, there are positive benefits from employment, there are positive benefits um, from other factors. You may choose to go ahead with one, but from a purely public health standpoint, you know, we look at prevention first and if you're looking to prevent problem gambling, clearly if you have less access to it, you're not going to have as much of that particular issue. The economic impact f f from a public health perspective is something you can focus in on. Our economic development department, however, can look at the positives. So through you, Mr. Mayor, to Tim, um, could you put something together with respect to all the positive aspects of the casino from an economic perspective? And we'll, we'll utilize Dr. Richardson's information uh, from the negative component from a public health aspect. Is, is that fine, Tim? Just so we can, you see where I'm heading with this, so we can actually evaluate the, the pros and cons? No, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, so yeah, I understand where you're heading. You want to see balanced information in order to make the best informed decision you have. Um, so there's been a lot of economic impact uh, studies that have been done by others. Um, for us to do it, Mr. Mayor, that would be quite the feat in the time restrictions that we have. And we can talk in generality about, you know, entertainment as part of um, you know, an, an advanced um, uh, tourism industry and in, in advanced downtown in terms of what goes with the casino in terms of the mixed land use and, and things to do. Um, so that wouldn't be empirical evidence that we could give you, but we certainly could round up some studies that have been done on the economic impacts of casinos for your information. Okay, that, that would be very helpful. So at, at the appropriate time, those are the issues that will move. Also, I, what I'd like to incorporate in molding this, the, the direction is the police input. I know that um, Chief De Carrot sent me a letter indicating he wanted to participate, um, and I think it's important that we do that sooner rather than later. So through you to uh, Madam Clerk, uh, any indication on when that report will be forthcoming? From the chief. No, I've not received any indication. Okay, so through you, oh, Mr. Mayor, do you have an answer? We uh, we can bring it forward with the police board, which is meeting soon. So, okay, so certainly in short order, we we'll get an answer. Okay, wonderful. So, um, so I, I won't do anything formally on that point. So, we'll just expect uh, an answer at the next meeting. Then, if you can put that on the agenda as an information item, that would be greatly appreciated. And if you can come back to me at the appropriate time uh, to move those items, that'd be uh, it'd be greatly appreciated. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. I have Councillor Pasuda Whitehead and Partridge on the speaker's list. Councillor Pasuda. Thank you, Mayor Bertina. Councillor Marul has covered a lot of items here and issues right now, answered some of my questions, but I'm going to go to the report that Dr. Richardson has here in front of us. And on page 5 of 11, and it's uh, prevalence of problem gambling. And in here, it states in here that in 2005, Gambling and Problem Gambling Ontario study estimated that 3.4 percent of the population experienced moderate to severe gambling problems. And through you, Mr. Mayor, to Dr. Richardson or Susan, is there is there an updated report other than 2005? Through the chair, at this time there isn't. Those are our most recent stats that we have. 
if I can add, so the 2005 is the is the gambling and problem gambling study in Ontario. The CCHS data, the Canadian Community Health data that is quoted within this report, as well as the Toronto report, comes from a 2007 analysis. The um, with the CCHS, there's a gambling module available, but each province decides whether or not they want to participate in that. And Ontario participated in it in 2002 and 2007. So that 2007 data is the, the, the most recent data that there is for Ontario. So those numbers and statistics are aged. And uh, in, this, in this day and age, and, and with the uh, increase in uh, different games of chance that are out there, the advertising that promotional OG has been doing, uh, there's no doubt that the numbers have uh, increased dramatically. Um, it's just unfortunate we can't get something more up to date, but uh, and and if this should go and it's going to be private operators running it, and I can tell you when you go to Las Vegas and been there a number of times, uh, the, their promotion advertising from the cabs to the buses to signs, it's just a total draw and gets more and more people to uh, to come out. And and I think we've noticed it, Mr. Mayor, we've noticed it in the newspaper even have lately how much more advertising OLG is doing to uh, hit the what I would say, the consumers of the uh, games of chance. So it's just uh, something that would be nice to have more up-to-date statistics, uh, even within the last two years, it would be much better because I can tell you there's more and more people attending these and the advertising is increasing dramatically. So it's something to be aware of. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for now. Thank you. And Councillor Whitehead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <coughs> Excuse me. In the report, it also says that the majority of individuals participating in gambling activities do not experience negative consequences from this behavior. What percentage would that be? You say majority, what is the percentage? Through you, Mr. Mayor, when you look at the issues of, of gambling in the CCHS data, there's sort of a, a continuum of people who go from having no adverse consequences whatsoever with gambling to um, those who do have problem gambling. And so if you look um, at some data that we did on for City of Hamilton, based on that 2007-2008 data, about 1% uh, of Hamiltonians were moderate risk or problem gamblers, about 4% um, returned to try to win back money they had lost, and about 18.9% spent more than they wanted to. So those over and above that, which with quick math in my head is about 75%, wouldn't have had an issue. 75%, okay. Uh, you indicated on the survey that uh, some said they spent more than they want to. Could that be said about people going shopping as well? Have you did a survey? For you, Mr. Mayor, I'm sure it could. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the other question I have is uh, the province of Ontario um, that brought in this uh, particular policy through three consecutive uh, uh, um, political parties, both in the NDP, Conservative, I think it was the NDP that implemented it, Conservatives expand on it, and of course now we hear uh, with the Liberal government. Like uh, we, we do here, uh, it's safe to assume that they would have did their own research, had their own reports. The, uh, the Chair? Through you, Mr. Mayor, I'm not privy to the decision-making process that was followed um, as those decisions were made. I'm sure um, as a group of professionals, they would have, uh, the people that uh, back those things up would have gone through, done their work in order to give advice to the, the governments of the day. Okay. Um, question is, can we, uh, do we have, or is there, do we have the ability to access that thought process? Thank you that thought process in regards to how the province of Ontario would have uh, come to the conclusion that casinos on the, on the uh, balance of uh, issues is better than, than not having them? For you, Mr. Mayor, I think if you wanted to ask about the thought process that went through, it would be best to ask the people who had done that. Okay. Now, the study that uh, re relied heavily on, uh, uh, was it the mental health, what's that organization? Center for Addictions and Mental Health, sorry. Thank you. Uh, I assume that the province of Ontario would have had access to the same information? For you, Mr. Mayor, um, again, I would assume that the, uh, the professionals who did the work at the provincial level would have, uh, would have worked with uh, a number of sources of information. Appreciate that. Uh, 
Is there clinical studies that suggest that low-income people are more predis predisposed to gambling uh, than anyone else in the social economic level? And I'm talking clinical now. No reason. Thank you, Chair. Um, I don't know of any clinical data that would indicate that. It's more indicated in the sort of general research evidence that we have. And sorry, how, how, can you remind me how that that uh, the, that information is uh, accumulated that you're citing? Methodology? Through you, Mr. Mayor. The, the information that we're citing comes from a, a number of literature reviews that have been done. There's been a literature review done by Williams in 2011 that looked at, uh, did a full review of the literature. So that would have used any types of literature that were available at that time. And Toronto Public Health updated that literature review for their report that they did this year. There's also a literature review that was done in 2007 around interventions. Um, and that as well was updated by Toronto Public Health in um, 2012 for their report that they did. So it's accessed all of the available evidence that is out there, um, not only the CCHS data that is there. So those associations have been seen in a number of studies as well as the CCHS data that, um, that's cited. Appreciate that. So no, uh, but it's, it's not clinically based. For you, Mr. Mayor, I'd have to go back to each of the source studies to be able to tell you that one way or the other. Thank you. Um, the other question I have is, in the report, it talks about uh, the fact that uh, when, when you talk about closer to the casino to a vulnerable population, uh, then obviously they're more susceptible. But also in the report, it clearly indicates that uh, it actually gives kilometers, I think it was 16 or 18 uh, kilometers. So. Uh, it, but it doesn't measure the difference between whether you're 20 kilometers out versus whether you're in uh, a direct location. It just says that you're vulnerable within 18 kilometers of a casino. Is that how I read that correct? Through you, Mr. Mayor, there's a, there's a few studies that look at this issue. Some of them have looked at um, a very close to the casino and a gradient that's over um, the distances that are lower than the 16 kilometers. And the others have looked at the um, the, the 16 kilometer, kilometer and uh, 80 kilometer boundaries. They're U.S. studies. They're actually 10 miles and 50 miles. That's why they, those uh, numbers are chosen. So there's different uh, studies that are there that sh that show that association. Now, uh, have we done any research? Uh, I believe OLG is suggesting that it's between 37 and 50,000 Hamiltonians visit uh, their sites throughout uh, Southern Ontario. Uh, from the city of Hamilton. Do we know how many of those are coming from downtown? For you, Mr. Mayor, could you repeat the question? The OLG has stated that between 37 and 50,000 people uh, visit their OLG casinos from the city of Hamilton. Do we have any idea how, where they're coming from? Through you, Mr. Mayor, that's not data that we've looked at. Okay. Uh, do we, are we aware of how many people leave downtown uh, through uh, free bus rides to casinos? Through you, Mr. Mayor, that's not information that we've looked at. Now, when you talk about uh, uh, red, readily having access to a casino, um, the fact that we have buses picking people up right in front of City Hall, for example, um, how does that play in the context of making, say, uh, a casino in another area within the region of the city of Hamilton, any safer if you have free and access to bus rides to those casinos from the downtown core? Through you, Mr. Mayor. The issue of transportation is one that's postulated, but in the, the reviews that are there, is there, it's not thoroughly researched in terms of the um, accessibility through transportation modalities. It's um, proposed that increasing um, the amount of transportation would increase the, the prevalence of gambling. But there's no, in the, the reviews that I've looked at here, there's, it's not strongly stated around that piece as compared to the issue of proximity from a, a living uh, within distance. So that's, that's a factor and that's the, where the research evidence is on it today. So we're, we're lacking information in regards to uh, whether the, uh, the impacts of uh, access to free bus rides to casinos from a vulnerable location has equal or, or less impact than a casino located in that location. 
agree, Mr. Mayor, from what I've read to date, yes. Okay. Um, I think those are all the questions I have for now. Councillor Partridge. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good morning, everyone. Um, through you to, uh, to Elizabeth, I think it would be Elizabeth that I'll ask the question to. Um, I'm just looking at the, um, the report 2007-2008, and I think we can safely say that one of the fastest growing areas of gambling is online gambling, and it's within teen teenagers. Would that be accurate? Through you, Mr. Mayor, the, the issues that have been looked at for this have been more around casinos like Toronto Public Health Report and whatnot. The issue of internet gambling is um, you know, certainly an area of expansion, but the Toronto Public Health Report talks about internet gamblers actually being quite different than casino-based gamblers and that um, they are a smaller population. So that's a, a modality that's from a study standpoint is just being explored. There's not a lot of good information on, but what we have to date suggests that they are quite different populations. We're not sure whether how big the overlap is between those, but there is some suggestion that they're a subset of, of uh, casino gamblers that particularly engage in that. Okay, and, and so that leads to my next question, which is, is there uh, any, any tracking or any studies in the works currently or that have been done that shows a linkage between online gambling leading to gambling uh, once they're older within a casino environment? For you, Mr. Mayor, as I said, the, the research evidence around this one, there's not a lot of, and there is not a lot of, of linking about starting online and then moving to, to some other modality. What we have today really just suggests that there, there may be a subpopulation of the casino population that tends to be better off, that does both online gambling and, uh, and casino gambling. And by better off, I mean socioeconomically. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and through you, Mr. Mayor, because it, it, really, it really does concern me that there is a population there that, um, uh, of young people that we don't appear to be tracking uh, and we're just scratching the surface on. If there's not a study in the works and things are changing so rapidly technology-wise within our world, and, and I, I find that very worrisome that we're not paying more attention to that. And when I say we, I don't necessarily mean our own public health, but uh, certainly on a provincial level. Is there, do you know of any studies in the works or anything going on? Through you, Mr. Mayor, not at this point. I mean, it's certainly an area that's ripe for study and an area that's being proposed for study and advocated for, but I'm not aware of something that's actually taking place at present. Okay, um, and there's been many good questions asked, so I just have a, a couple more. With regards to the Flamborough Casino, is there any information that you have on the population base surrounding Flamborough of any increase in problem gambling? For you, Mr. Mayor, it's not um, information that we have at this point. We have not done something longitudinally in terms of looking at problem gambling in our particular population over time. Okay, and, uh, and I did hear you say earlier that uh, you're currently not tracking through postal codes or through areas of the city where the problem gambling hotspots are. Through you, Mr. Mayor, currently we, the, there is a postal code that is collected um, where people will give that to us. We haven't done any mapping of where the problem gamblers come from within our community. Okay, and I think I heard you uh, reply to Councillor, <laughs> bless you, Marula, that um, that was something that you were going to, to look at, and, and I'd be very interested to see that as well. Through you, Mr. Mayor, we can look at that. I think it is really important to note that when we're talking about problem gambling, only about one to two percent of those who do have a problem with gambling actually seek and receive treatment. So our subset would be a very small subset of the actual problem, and it would be a distinct group that's actually sought treatment. So it's, we can map that, but I would just very much caution as to how well that characterizes the, the general problem in Hamilton. And that segues very nicely, thank you, into my next, uh, my next question um, through you, Mr. Mayor. 
You, you just said a very small percentage actually seek help. So do you think that there's far more people out there that are having to deal with than we actually have coming to see us in the clinics? Through you, Mr. Mayor, I'll turn to Susan um, to, to offer any additional advice. But when we look at the, at the issue, if you look at the rates of problem gambling from survey data, looking at a range of about 1% to 3% um, being the higher risk, moderate to high risk problem gamblers, that would translate into about 5,000 or more Hamiltonians. When you look at the treatment data, it's estimated that only about 1% to 2% of those come for treatment. And Susan can attest to the, the rates within uh, our own clinic. It's 1% to 2%. That's extremely low. So for our clinic, um, we would estimate that we probably see around 100 people that actually come in for individual counseling in a year. So we're looking at just being above the 1% because 1% would be about 50. We do see a lot more people when we do prevention activities. We usually reach about 1,000 people to do prevention promotion. So about 100 people a year is all that... that we actually see in the clinics. And if, if you could, Susan, could you just explain how that process works? How do you actually outreach to people? And what is it that drives them to actually come in and seek help, in your opinion? Through the chair, um, to answer the first part of the question, um, our problem gambling staff are also, so they do counseling, but they're also um, in charge of doing prevention promotion. And so they will go out to uh, health fairs. Um, we go to MAC, we go to DeFasco, we go to different um, work health fairs. So we get the information out that way. Um, at various times, we've done different marketing sort of campaigns to get our sort of program out in the community so people know where available. I'm sorry, Susan, I can't yeah. hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. So we also had different times have done different marketing campaigns to get our sort of program available, information available in the community. Um, and then we're, you know, in certain areas, like we're connected to the Ontario Problem Gambling Helpline, so that if people call that number, you'll find that in different gaming sites, then that service links them back to our service. And so as far as people, you know, when do they finally, you know, come to see us, it's really variable. A lot of times it is around financial um, sort of crisis that has started. It can be around family um, crisis that has come up. Uh, some people have, it's starting to impact their work. So there's lots of different variables that will lead people eventually to seeking treatment. Thank you, Susan. And my last uh, question, uh, Mr. Mayor, in, um, in looking at how you do your outreach, do you partner with the uh, casinos that are located within our, our area at Flamborough? Um, is there availability for information on our public health service that we offer? And do you partner with doctors and reach out to other clinics? Through the chair. So there is when at Flamborough Downs there is an information sort of kiosk and all of our pamphlets are located there. Um, once a year, and now it's becoming, I think, once every two years, we're with the Responsible Gambling Council, and we go there to do during Gambling Prevention Awareness Week, so we'll be on site for one or two sort of days. Um, besides that, we don't have any other, like, on-site um, partnership with o OLG at this point. And I'm sorry, the follow-up to your question? It was, it was re regarding physicians. Oh, with physicians. Um, we don't have any direct partnerships right now with physicians. And something that has sort of happened over the years is that when we look at, at budget, the amount of money, operational money that we have to do marketing has started to decrease in our budget. So that's something that, you know, we'll be sort of looking at. Because we have found in previous years, the more outreach we do to directly to people, then it tends to be the more folks we have coming in for service. All right, and thank you for that. It is uh, very worrisome, and as I've said before, I do support the casino located at Flamborough. I do not support one in the downtown core. Yeah, I'd prefer you didn't do that. Thank you. Um, so, you know, I think everything that's in this report 
is is great at first blush, but I think there's a mountain of information that we don't have on our own gambling uh, facility that's located here. And certainly if there was to be one in the core. But uh, I thank you for the report. Thank you, Mr. Thanks, Councillor Partridge. I have Councillor Farr. Thank you and thanks to the Gaming Committee for having me uh, today and uh, all of those who are in attendance. And uh, first thing I want to know procedurally, I'm not sure. I know we received uh, this uh, report, your report, at our last Public Health Board of Health meeting and there was the four recommendations. Are they set to be approved here today or do they go back to uh, Board of Health through you, Mr. Mayor? Through you, Mr. Mayor, I think that question would best be directed to the clerks. Carolyn? No, this report was referred from Board of Health to this subcommittee, so they are before the subcommittee today for consideration. Any reports that are required to go back as a result of the recommendations, though, would go back to Board of Health, unless specifically indicated that they would come to either General Issues Committee or back to this subcommittee. Okay, so just so I understand, the uh, recommendations then from Board of Health from last Monday are going to be approved or not approved here today with a committee of five, okay. Um, uh, could, uh, could I just explain that none of, we make no final decisions at the subcommittee. We recommend, we report to GIC. To GIC. Okay, thank you, thank you. So, Doc, Dr. Richardson, um, through you, Mr. Mayor, in your report, I just want to reiterate, and if, if it's been discussed before, you can be brief, that's fine. But the majority of casino patrons are often from the community around at the local community through the chair. We know this? Through you, Mr. Mayor, yes. The majority of casino patrons tend to come from the area around the casino um, rather than from further away. And we know through the chair that the higher rates of uh, problem gambling emanates from those who live close to the casino. Through you, Mr. Mayor, yes. There's evidence that the closer you are in proximity to the, get to the casino, the more likely you are to engage in the casino and potentially have problem gambling. And we know, I guess, through the chair that it should be a concern or maybe even a reality that those uh, susceptible will become even more so with the increased availability through the chair. Through you, Mr. Mayor, yes. For particular subgroups, it, it varies in terms of whether they're more likely to um, have uh, problem gambling. As I was saying earlier, some will have higher rates of problem gambling, while others will just have a higher um, impact from problem gambling. Uh, one of the committee members asked a question about uh, centered around lower income folks and uh, whether or not they would spend more. The report indicates, as I read it through the chair, that proportionately they would spend more. Is that correct? Through you, Mr. Mayor, that's correct. Proportionately. levels of the city are high as well. Okay. Uh, the issues of problem gambling. I'm wondering, um, when you look at the report and you, the Toronto Public Health in collaboration with the Ontario Problem Gambling Institute for the Centre of Addiction and Mental Health identify that problem gambling is a significant public health issue. I'm wondering if you can offer where it would rank as a public health issue uh, in terms of all the other public health issues that you're dealing with and given what we have in the report through the chair. For you, Mr. Mayor, I haven't seen it as a, as a ranking around public health issues. I think um, in terms of looking at problem gambling as a public health issue, it's a, a newer um, perspective 
that's been taken on the issue within Ontario. It was the Centre for Addictions and Mental Health that really looked at that framework in about 2009-2010 uh, with the work that they did that came out in 2011. Um, so I don't think it's really um, been ranked in terms of the traditional public health issues around safe water or um, those sorts of issues, infection control. But when you look at it on a population level, it's, it certainly has uh, a significant impact when we're talking about 1 to 2 percent, 1 to 3 percent of the population, 5,000 people within Hamilton potentially being problem gamblers. Thank you. Uh, through the chair. So. In the report, there's some startling statistics, and I'm sure many communities would find this startling, municipalities throughout the North America and the world. Um, but when you look at points that, that this report refers to, like individuals with lower socioeconomic and are, are proportionally spending more money, money they don't have, frankly, right? So. And then you look at the, the, the youth factor and the statistics with respect to grades 7 and 12, and Councillor Partridge was mentioning that, it uh, goes as high as 6 to 8% of uh, problem gambling. Um, higher rates of suicide attempts because of problem gambling with youth. Uh, and uh, that seems to me to be the major uh, cause of suicide attempts of the suicide attempt causes with youth. It also goes on to report that uh, it could lead to youth gangs and guns and, and uh, that sort of uh, criminal behavior in youth. And then there's the Aboriginal communities and the seniors and all of that. So given that and given what we know and what this vast report, which looks at many other uh, important uh, discoveries through other reports over the years, um, would you suggest that the downtown core um, is probably not the best place to locate a casino? Through the chair. Through you, Mr. Mayor, and looking at these issues, as we've uh, said earlier on, when you consider gambling from a, from a public health perspective alone, from the health impacts of gambling, you would certainly say that if we didn't have gambling, you would minimize those health impacts. There's only a few studies um, and primarily those are among seniors that have looked at the health benefits of, of uh, gambling and suggest there might be some neutral or, or positive impact to recreational gambling among seniors. So when you look at it purely from a public health standpoint, the, the health impacts certainly seem to outweigh any health benefit. But that's not the only um, route that we look at uh, things at. And when you look at it more broadly in terms of employment, economic impacts, and the resultant health impacts of those, which we have not done, um, then you'd have to, it, it may give you a, an overall picture that is different. When you're considering where to locate one, to think about the impacts of on vulnerable populations, and as I said earlier, there are certainly vulnerable populations downtown, but there are vulnerable populations elsewhere within the city as well. But considering proximity, ease of access, as well as the types of gaming that, that happen at those casinos, because elect, electronic gaming slots and other um, modalities do increase the problem gambling. And so you, it's really a, quite a complex analysis to consider in the siting. Um, as I said earlier, from a public health standpoint, those are the factors you consider. Uh, whether to do it all and how, where to locate it would be uh, related to proximity and those factors. Okay, through the chair. Thank you, Dr. Richardson, for the answers. I, I need to understand that you, or you, you, I'm just trying to understand, you're mentioning other areas of the city where we have vulnerable populations, but there's no doubt in your mind through the chair that the highest concentration of vulnerable populations is here in the heart of our city. For you, Mr. Mayor, you know, I can so, totally appreciate from a socioeconomic standpoint that those, uh, those populations absolutely are in the, the lower city. The challenge is when we start to map out and, the, and we look at the number of populations that are vulnerable, when we include youth, Aboriginal populations and others, it becomes a little bit more muddy. Seniors is, an, is another group. But certainly there is a concentration of people who would be vulnerable here. Okay, thank you. One final question, um, Mr. Mayor, uh, through you. The longitudinal study, and I asked this and I appreciate the, uh, the Board of Health offering me uh, the latitude last meeting, but I'm still trying to understand. Longitudinal study that's in your recommendations means to study while the, once the casino is in place. Not a study pre-casino, but a study during. Through the chair? 
For you, Mr. Mayor, the, the study that we're recommending actually would be both. It would okay. begin now and establish baselines in terms of um, problem gambling and, and those sorts of factors, economic, you know, current economic status, and then would follow those forward after um, any changes were made and what, what had happened in terms of changes in problem gambling, health effects, economic effects, employment effects, all of those things. Okay, thank you, Doc. And, and then that in addition to the recommendations we're hearing that are going to hit the floor soon from uh, the Ward 4 Council, right? Through you, Mr. Mayor, yes, in addition to the operating policies and, and stepping back and thinking about it from that broader public health approach. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. I have myself as a first-time speaker, and then we'll go back to Councillor Whitehead and Councillor Marula. Councillor Pursuta, would you take the chair, please? Thank you. So, and uh, through you to um, Susan or Dr. Richardson, on page 8 of 11, there is the piece on gaming availability. Now, Hamilton historically was notorious for being a place uh, for unregulated gambling. And the late Jim Coleman wrote, and I had many discussions with him about the good old days when after, for instance, the Leafs would play in Toronto on a Saturday night, they would all come over to Hamilton because that's where the card games were and that's where the, the kind of the action was. Toronto had that kind of uh, cold reputation in those days. And Angelo Mosca has said many times publicly that when he first came here in the 1950s, within a week he, he knew where several places were to play poker and, and so on. So my question directly is, do we have any data on the prevalence or prevalence of unregulated gambling today? Are we aware of card games, uh, dice games, uh, any other sorts of gambling. Classically, of course, we had the bookie in the tavern. Uh, you know, the, that was supplanted when they did the, uh, the off-track betting uh, places such as the Driftwood Tavern had one and a, and a few of the Waverly down on Barton Street. So that kind of did away with the bookie. But do we have any data currently on gambling that is not regulated and therefore done you know, under the, the radar. Through you, Mr. Chair. Through you, Mr. Chair. When we look at the, the CCHS data, which is the survey data, I don't know that they differentiate between legal gambling and illegal gambling. Um, and so I'm not, I'm not certain about, about that factor in terms of prevalence. When it comes to gambling sites, and legal versus illegal gambling, that's a question that would be better answered by the police than by ourselves. Okay, that's fair enough. I will bring that up because, you know, in the heyday of the, the, the pre-casino slots era, uh, Albert Welsh and the Vice Squad were always raiding uh, Fantan games on King William Street, social clubs on James Street North. Um, uh, the grandstand that used to exist at Eastwood Park where dice games were notorious. So. The point that I, I would like to get to in my question is when the casino slots era began and then we find the statistics of uh, increased um, gambling problems, uh, addictive behavior related to gambling, could it be that once the gambling was so brought into the open in terms of attendance at casinos and so on, and the ability of people with gambling issues to actually have them addressed through the casinos, and you know there have been some famous uh, lawsuits and so on in that regard, that the casino actually exposed more problem gambling than the pre-regulated era when the games were you know in the back rooms of stores and and so on. Does, does that make sense that that the casino slots? Um, locations have shone a light on addictive behaviors. Is that a fair question? Through you, Mr. Mayor, that's a difficult question to answer. You know, in terms of the research, the you know, when we look at the at the evidence, there's there's always an issue whenever you do survey data that there's what's called an, an acceptability bias, that people who are more likely to answer a question truthfully if the behavior you're asking about is socially ac acceptable. Now, anonymity, as happens with all of these surveys, helps. It helps to 
to um, to encourage people to answer honestly. Um, so it's 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 very difficult to say if that's actually the case in this particular instance. What we do know um, from some of the studies that have been done around casinos opening in other areas is about two thirds of those show that when a casino opens. The, the rate goes up of problem gambling. And so that would not, that would seem to be just related to that casino rather than related to something being legitimate or illegitimate. Uh, finally, through you, Mr. Chair, I've been trying to review some other uh, jurisdictions. You look at the European experience, and if you put problem gambling in Europe, it's mostly linked to lotteries. Uh, the city of Paris has a number of casinos and in fact is famous for them uh, and there's hardly a French movie that there isn't a scene of a card game in a casino but uh, it seems that they uh, they direct their concerns uh, in terms of lottery so do we have any information uh, through you Mr. Deputy Chair on the European experience and how they are approaching the issues of problem gambling for you, Mr. Um, Chair, the uh, issue of gambling that had, that's been done in these studies, the problem gambling that's been reviewed, these have been systematic reviews. So they go through and look at the English literature and gather studies from wherever they may come. Um, in looking at what has been generated, much of it is Canadian, to reference the Canadian context and to um, specifically give that. There is information from the United States, there is information from New Zealand. There's not in what I see a specific European framework that's put forward, and that wasn't something that we looked at in looking at the reviews that were out there to pursue the European perspectives specifically. Thank you. Um, those are my questions, uh, Councillor. And so, Councillor Whitehead and Councillor Marula. Councillor Whitehead. Can I ask, um, through the Chair, when we look at uh, inoculations, is there any percentage of people that get inoculated that are at risk? For you, Mr. Mayor, I'm not certain what the question is getting at. <laughs> I'm just not sure what you mean by at risk. Well, I'm, I'm saying that there's, you know, whether it's the autism groups or, 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 uh, or, or certain uh, vulnerable groups that uh, do not get uh, inoculations because there has been instances uh, through inoculations that has created uh, some severe problems for, for our youth. So the question is, is anyone at risk, anyone at risk when they take inoculation? For you, Mr. Mayor, uh, vaccinations in general care are, are very safe. They're one of the safest inter interventions that we have. There is, with any vaccine, um, a list of people for whom it's indicated and a list of people, which is rather short, for whom it's contraindicated. So allergy, for example, is a um, is the most often cited uh, reason, but there are some other reasons. Pregnant women, for example, with certain of our live vaccines. Um, so there's different factors. It varies for every vaccine that's on the market um, as to what the specifics are for that particular vaccine. I appreciate that. I think what I'm, I'm getting at is that uh, there's a public policy because there's greater good served through inoculation, but doesn't suggest that there's no one at risk that be a correct statement? For you, Mr. Mayor, I, I, I honestly, I'm not sure how to answer that question. Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, alcohol, tobacco. When we look at this report, I was looking at uh, one on alcohol specifically, and it, it almost mirrors this report in regards to uh, the vulnerable uh, uh, groups and, uh, and the percentages. Would you agree with that? For you, Mr. Mayor, I don't have statistics around alcohol and, and uh, other substance abuse at my fingertips at the moment. Fair enough. Uh, can we ask uh, to take a look at that comparison between tobacco, alcohol, and, and, and casinos to just have a, a context and a benchmark? I think it's more about benchmarking. Uh, to understand where the casino issue is on that benchmark relative to tobacco and alcohol. For you, Mr. Mayor, it's something we could we could look at. I, I would want to know further what it is that's that we're actually being asked to produce. 
Well, I think I, I said, Mr. Mayor, it's a benchmark. So what, what is this, the statistical information in regards to uh, people that uh, develop alcoholism? Who, what are the groups that are, are vulnerable to alcoholism? Uh, tobacco addictions, uh, those are benchmarks. Uh, we are, you're already identifying a sort of benchmarks in casino. I just want uh, to have that context to see where uh, the, the, the casino issue is relative to those other issues that are public health policies and, and legal in the province of Ontario. Through you, Mr. Mayor, in terms of, I understand your point better, thank you. Um, in terms of alcohol, drugs and gambling, there's actually a, um, we call them the facts, um, that was produced in September of this year that does look at alcohol, drugs and gambling within Hamilton and it may be that that report would be one that would provide you the information you ha you're looking for. So that's uh, one we can send to you. Appreciate it. The, um, something indicated, I mean, I've had this, this call and, and they say casinos kill. So mm -hmm. I'm going to address that issue directly. You're a public health, uh, 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 you're a doctor. Uh, is it casinos that kill or is it depression that kills? Let's get, let's move down that line through the chair. Through you, Mr. Mayor, that's a very difficult question to answer. It's as with any particular uh, behavior. Um, there's there's the behaviors that relate to it that ultimately result in a death. So if you're that the the pathway to a death is complex, and there's many different routes there. So if you're looking at uh, at casinos, there's issues that relate to depression, suicides that may result. There's issues around alcohol use and traffic f fatalities that might result from that. There's issues around fatigue and traffic fatalities that might result from that. So it's a it's a complex issue in in that regard. So uh, to make that blanket statement would be unfair. Sure. That's for you, Mr. Mayor. I think that would be in the you know, for each individual to decide on their own. Thank you. Those are all the questions. Councillor, we have um, Councillor uh, Marula and then Councillor Pasuda. Councillor. Actually, I'm prepared to, to move my motions, um, Mr. Mayor, unless you want me to hold off to Councillor Pasuda's. Unless Councillor Pasuda wishes to add something, then you can get to your motion. Mayor Bertina, uh, a couple things, and we're talking about problem gambling. I have a question through you, Mr. Mayor, and I don't know who can answer this, it's even possible, but we've been talking here today about uh, problem gambling and, and uh, people ages 12 and up that are a problem. Um, tickets that are sold to underage people, is there a, is there a law, and I, personally I know there is, but is there a law that, what's the age that you can buy tickets, scratch tickets and that? at uh, counters. Chair? For you, Chair, um, it's 18 to buy lottery tickets or scratch tickets. Okay, so thank you for that. So now we have a bylaw for cigarettes in the city and our bylaw officers enforce that. Do our bylaw officers enforce it for lottery tickets too in the city? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to whoever can answer that, sir? Anybody? Tim? No? Who would regulate that? Who would enforce that? Alcohol and uh, ACGO? So we don't know, Mr. Mayor. So I'd have to get back to you. I don't think Marty's group. Well, it's a provincially regulated one. would assume it would be similar to liquor offenses, I, I would guess, overcrowding in a bar or something like that. So. Uh, no answer to that. It's unfortunate that we can't control that through bylaw because that's the, it starts to be the, a problem from that age up. Um, on page uh, 10 of 11 here, and we've got, it states here, finally that following our key operating policies should be considered for implementation for any changes to gambling that are contemplated. And Mr. Mayor, I'm just wondering here if any staff person could answer these questions. In here we've got uh, bullet points and it talks about prohibiting ATMs on the gambling floor implementing a maximum bet size and a daily maximum loss, designating areas for alcohol purchase, not providing alcohol service on casino floors to reduce impaired judgment, and it goes on and on down here. Can we or do we have any influence on an operator proprietor of a gaming site within the city? Do we have any influence on these items or is that under their jurisdiction as running the business? Through you, Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the Councillor, uh, we uh, have put that question to OLG and we're awaiting response to that question. Thank you. 
Okay. Councillor Whitehead wanted something, then I'll come to Marula, Councillor Marula. Actually, one question I, I, I failed to ask is, uh, my, I need Tim's help, and I'll have to go back to Dr. Richardson. In the city of Hamilton, um, what locations in Hamilton uh, is the, basically a destination place? So it basically uh, attracts uh, a lot of people from outside the community and, and to stay here. Is there any other location, or can you identify what those locations are? So, Mr. Mayor, just to clarify, from a destination point of view, so like our points of attraction, is that what you're talking about? If I was just took a, st a statistic and, say, uh, and, and identify uh, the, the geographic area that has the highest number of tourists that come into this community or stay over in the hotels or go to a concert or convention or any of those kinds of things, what geographic area in the city of Hamilton has the, that kind of attraction? Well, without a doubt, Mr. Mayor, it's a downtown. It's got the most hotel facilities, restaurants, and, and uh, all the heck five facilities and things to do. Okay, I appreciate that. Now, the question I have through the chair to Dr. Richardson is, um, would we not expose more local people to uh, uh, gambling by locating an area that is not a destination point? So you're not, you're not, there's no reason for visitors to go there unless they were prepared to make the, 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 the jaunt. Versus, uh, again, the, uh, I think the argument you made is accessibility is, is one of the key issues. So if you've got a further distance to those tourists, then you probably have less of those tourists actually utilizing the casino. Through you, Mr. Mayor, I can't tell you what the, the, the um, visitor patterns are for casinos. That would be something that economic development might have. Okay, uh, so the question, again, I, I, I would ask is, uh, just from a common sense point of view, if you have if you have 50, if you have if you have thirty thousand visitors in the downtown, and you have uh, a casino out in Flamborough, uh, how much of that? How many of those visitors would you be able to tap into versus exposing a local, the local? Anyway, I don't think you can answer, but I, you know where I'm going with it. Thanks. Okay, Councillor Merlin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a couple of motions, and then I'd like to uh, say a few words after the second one. Um, the first one um, is moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Pasuda. The staff be directed uh, to provide tracking and mapping of existing problem gamblers in the city of Hamilton by postal code and report to committee. And that's seconded by Councillor Pasuda. Put that question, uh, all in favor? Carried. Thank okay. you. And on the second one, that staff be uh, directed to provide an e economic impact report weighing the pros and cons of a casino impact on public health and economic development. And if I can say a few words on that particular issue, Go ahead. I think it's important um, from my perspective, as I mentioned earlier, I think proximity does matter. I personally am consistent with what this council has approved and Flamborough being the site and that's where I'd like to see it continue. Having said that, I think we do need to have a respectful debate and include all of the information because clearly the information is before us. Um, when you look at the, the economic pros and cons, I, I can assure you when you incorporate the, the social aspects and the costs associated with that, coupled, coupled with the, the human um, tragedies associated with it, uh, that the question clearly is that proximity does matter and Flamborough really is the only site that we should continue operating this casino. Having said that, I think you know, based on what Councillor uh, Whitehead has mentioned, I think a lot of those issues uh, I think tie into some of the misinformation that exists which lends credence to my opening questions surrounding really what is an addiction, uh, the difference between physical addiction and substance abuse versus that of behavioral addictions. And and I think that in itself, we should have perhaps an in-service uh, because to compare apples to oranges when you're dealing with a comp complex issue as we are today, does no one any good. Frankly, it's a disservice rather than a service. So having said that, at the appropriate time, I'd like to provide a notice of motion that we actually have an in-service just to clearly understand the, what addiction means, the, the, the different types of addictions and impacts and how it plays a role uh, in making this decision. Because uh, I frankly believe that we don't have um, collectively the fundamental understanding 
of, of the importance of that issue in itself in making this decision. Also, um, in, in looking at and looking at what I've what I've learned today, over and above that proximity matters, is that casinos, particularly in cities like like Hamilton, uh, really are only targeting their residents. And you mentioned Europe as an example, and I'll mention Monaco. It's frankly illegal to 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 actually gamble in, Mon in Monte Carlo, of all places, for their residents to actually to actually gamble there. Um, so. Uh, clearly, there's a reason for that, and the reason is the social aspects associated with it. They're targeting their tourists, as Paris, France would be targeting tourism. We in Hamilton don't have that luxury. Ottawa might, um, Ottawa, uh, Toronto definitely does, but we don't. And I think uh, you look at OOG's uh, business plan back at the conception of all of the casinos in Ontario, it was focused on border towns. And targeting Americans, we had a seventy-cent dollar. They were all border town located. It was clearly illustrated what they were attempting to do. They were attempting to draw in Americans and tourists at the seventy-cent dollar American to to spend money in Canada. That's fizzled out now. Americans have their own casinos and their own problems associated with those casinos. So now, what does OAG do? Well, we're losing money. So rather than targeting the tourists, let's target our own residents. And I say to you, you look at what their, their, their actual plan is, their plan is to, const to go where the people are. Well, where the people are, are where the problems are. So in essence, if you compound that with the socioeconomic issues that Hamilton has in those areas, they're no better than a crack dealer. And, and that's... <laughs> and, and, and that's really where I find it passionately um, opposed to this issue because the human aspect of all of this has really not been part of the equation. And having, as I mentioned, uh, uh, being an addictions counselor by trade, mind you, I've been out of it now for 15 years. I'm a little rusty, but one thing I do know for a fact, my memory of the human aspect of addiction is quite clear and it's tragic. Thank you very much, Mr. Martin. Thank you for those comments. <laughs> So we covered your motion, uh, Councillor Marula, and then you offered a notice of motion. So, on, on the notice of motion, just that uh, we uh, direct staff to incorporate a in service for um, this committee as well as all of council to be invited to with respect to the topic being addictions and the impact on on community. Okay. Uh, so uh, thank you, um, Councillor Whitehead. Do I have another speaker at this point? No, I, I'm some, I have no problem with uh, what's been requested in the motion, uh, so I suggest we vote on the motion, then I have further comments or questions. Thank you. Okay, uh, uh, on the motion? Yeah, so we're fine. Well, I am at the pleasure of uh, committee, so. Move to waive the rules, Partridge, Whitehead. Yes, go ahead, Tim. Mr. Mayor, if I could just clarify yeah. uh, Councilor Marula's motion about staff preparing an economic report and a public, public health report weigh, weighing the pros and cons. So we're not, from an economic development point of view, going to be playing off anything that I respect from Dr. Richardson. So Dr. Richardson is going to be giving you the public health perspective and any additional information you have. We're going to give you the economic impact. We are not going to, as staff, going to compare the two and oh no no I'm not asking you to okay so just, just the wording just provide, about okay just to doing the pros data. and cons no, of each no. so we're going to give you both you for a balanced um, uh, decision making perspective right. and you can weigh the pros so and through cons. you mr. mr. mayor yes all, all I'm asking for is all the pros from your perspective and all, all the negatives from the public health perspective and we'll we'll come to our own conclusion which I think will be quite clear thank you mr. mayor Okay, um, <laughs> Councillor Whitehead, did you yeah. want? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I, um, I remember taking, uh, when I was at university, I took a course on, uh, uh, was in economics, and uh, in economics, they talked about uh, the fact that to have full employment, you would have to have between three and five percent people unemployed. So you would create a system, uh, and that's why you see a lot of countries, uh, when they deem they have full employment, 
you still have between 3 and 5% unemployed. And that's why it's so important to ensure that uh, there's a strong social net to address those individuals. And the reason I raise that, Mr. Mayor, is that public policy is usually looked at in, in the context, I mean, first of all, we're not a bubble uh, wrap society. We all have to take on our own responsibilities, one. Two, uh, but we've got to ensure that we don't leave anyone behind and we have, uh, that's why we have strong regulations. Prohibition obviously uh, didn't work. Uh, more people were getting access to alcohol than ever and they were doing it under, on the underground. And they created, uh, so they brought it back out and they regulated it. Well, casinos are, are different. I mean, casinos and gambling was going on probably since uh, since the beginning of time. And the reality is, is that it was underground and it was affecting and impacting people unregulated. So uh, the, the reality is, is that uh, as opposed to having unregulated and dealing with the social issues, governments have uh, brought in casinos and regulated them. Can there be strong, stronger regulations to deal with the issues that uh, our, our good doctor has presented in the report? Absolutely. Uh, when you take a look, Mr. Uh, Mayor, at uh, the face recognition, and now we're looking at these, these new uh, 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 cards that can monitor the activity and the individuals and then uh, create intervention programs, uh, it's coming a long way in regards to ensuring that we have regulations to protect people. We have regulations on alcohol. We have regulations on, on tobacco. This is no different. But public policy normally is dealing with the majority of the population. So if you have, and we've already heard, 75%, 80% of the population is not impacted. So we shouldn't be writing policy based on 3 and 4%. We should be writing policy based on the majority, but ensuring, ensuring that we're protecting those that need to be protected. So I, I certainly appreciate uh, uh, the different points of view. The other thing, Mr. Mayor, I wanted to, to raise is that uh, I think it's important when we talk about accessibility, and I did ask Dr. Richardson the, the, the question, and, and, and we don't have the stats, and, and, and it's not in the medical report, because it talks about location casino, but it doesn't talk about location and access. So again, when you have buses and buses and buses, picking people up in the very location downtown and take them off to casinos, how does that skew the, the, the numbers? I mean, what is the greater uh, degree of risk if you take those two measurables? Is that, is that uh, means that the risk is actually less because they're already doing it? I don't know the answer to that question because we don't have that, that data, that information. I think it's important to have it. And lastly, uh, Mr. Mayor, I think it's also important uh, to understand that, uh, at least I believe, if you have an area that's designated for entertainment, you have an area that's, uh, uh, that the city has made significant investments in, Cops Coliseum, Hamilton Place, Convention Center, Art Gallery, Theater Quarries, huge contributions, and attracts people from far and wide. No question about that. I think when I was in HECFI, uh, the, the, the number of concerts, and they have, they have the numbers, the, the, the percentage of people coming out of town. And I remember uh, attending concerts and, 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 and going downtown in a restaurant and meeting people from Kitchener, uh, uh, Ottawa, and that just to come down and catch uh, the Who concert, for example. So there's a lot of people come in. We don't have any, those conditions exist in those numbers anywhere else in the city. So if we take a look at uh, and the consideration of, of, of locations and casinos, I'm hearing from Dr. Richardson that um, the location would pr primarily attract the local residents. To mitigate that, isn't it make sense to put it where you have a lot more people coming in from outside the community versus locating an area that really you don't have a lot of visitation and then you are truly putting more people at risk within, the, within those other locations. So I think those are at least issues that uh, we need to flush out and talk about. I believe that some of the recommendations coming from uh, Dr. Richardson absolutely make sense. And again, we're back to the, uh, the, 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 the card. Uh, I think that's important so we can measure uh, who's using it, how much they're using it, and, and whether intervention is necessary. The other very serious matter here for me is that the, casino, the, the gambling issues are already here in the city of Hamilton. They already exist. We have programs. And are they enough? We heard that there's a, a, a very small percentage that come forward to seek help. So obviously, uh, we need to find uh, creative, innovative ways for education, regardless of casino now. This is not even about having a casino downtown. This is about the programs. The bigger question is, do we have enough dollars? 
without going to the tax levy to address these issues that are already here. And I would suggest to you that uh, without going to the tax levy and increasing taxes, we probably can't get into these more proactive, innovative, or, um, interactive intervention type programs to get to that percentage that are not coming into the uh, uh, and seeking help. And the only way you can do that is with the dollar. And where does that dollar come from? So I think it's important to understand the whole issue in, in, in its entirety as we move forward. I think there's some great suggestions uh, that not only uh, has come forward from Dr. Richardson, but some uh, that we've brought forward. I would only ask through the, the Deputy Mayor, sorry, through the, through the Mayor to, to Tim, on the Planning Act, what is the distance that uh, is required for notification? Is it 100 metres? Um, for a property that would need a rezoning, is that what you mean? Correct. That would be 120 metres um, from the boundary of the subject property. If it was a variance, it's 60 metres. Thank you. So I think uh, whether we take that standard or as a different standard, I think one thing we didn't talk about in the context of conditions is uh, proximity to residents. I don't think uh, any of these suggestions that we had dealt with last week or even this week, has it taken consideration the proximity to a, a residence and what would be uh, um, the type of distance that we should be looking at? And I would, I'm not going to suggest one at this point by any stretch of the imagination, but I think that's something uh, that uh, I'll be working with staff and, and seeing if we can uh, identify what would be a reasonable number, maybe work with public health as well. Uh, so that we have a base uh, to ensure that uh, uh, we're not, you know, plucking this thing. Where if, if we do pluck it, it's not going anywhere that you have a house right next door kind of thing. Um, we need to make sure that, the, that the, those, and that's not even about the gambling issues. It's more about the, the you know, the noise and everything else that comes with those kinds of facilities. So I, uh, I, I look forward to the continued debate. I do uh, remain open-minded and I will continue challenging um, some of the assumptions, uh, but I uh, do plan to exercise my vote without drawing a line in the sand uh, at the time that we have to. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, we have a motion that we haven't gotten to, although we waived the rules. So are you prepared to yes, go ahead with the motion yes, now? So just move by myself, seconded by uh, Councillor uh, Whitehead, that um, that staff be directed to provide an in-service for committee and council, or for council with respect to addictions and uh, the impact on community. All in favor. Carried. That's carried. And, uh, Mr. Mayor, if I can clarify, on the report surrounding the economic development component, what, what we're looking for is pros and cons from an economic perspective and the cons from a public health perspective. So mm -hmm. in essence, uh, Tim, uh, uh, just to clarify, you understood that, right? Yeah, I thought so. Okay. Just want to clarify. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And thanks for all your leadership on this. I know that you have an excellent background, Councillor Marula, in, in addictions, in counseling and so on. And so that's very helpful to our, our work. Although I have to say, I looked up the Monte Carlo thing. And Princess Caroline, when she decided that the country was going broke and that let's bring all these people in and take their money in a casino, uh, she had a kind of a fundamental orthodox approach from her own personal belief standard. And that's why she put a ban on local participation. In terms of poverty, Monaco, well, to put it in perspective, the gross national income of Canada is $45,000. The gross national income of Monaco is $183,000, so I don't think they're no, no, grappling with the same issues we have. Um, no, no, on that point, and my wife is from there, so I, I know very well, uh, I'm very familiar with it, spent a lot of time there, but there was a movement uh, from the casino industry to actually take that away because because of that wealth, they wanted to target it. And uh, those casinos, however, are owned, are publicly owned, and some of the um, uh, restaurants wanted the, the private citizens to actually participate, and then that was uh, ruled down. So, so there was an attempt to reverse that. Thanks so much. In 1991, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> Very good conversation point, and I appreciate it. So, uh, we have uh, a motion to approve recommendations A to D in the uh, in the report. So, can we deal with that, Madam Clerk? Is that, uh, where, where do we go now with our... Sorry? A to D? On 
point one, we have the uh, Department of the Board of Health recommendations, which we would approve as the subcommittee and send off to the GIC. So may I have a motion, please, on Whitehead, uh, Marula, all in favor? That's carried. So now we're on to 4.2, which is uh, additional casino conditions. And just for the help of committee, and Councillor Fire, you're welcome to uh, continue, of course. Um, we, we polled, uh, we've had a number of opportunities for members of council and members of the subcommittee, of course, to bring conditions forward. So uh, is there anything anyone wishes to add uh, before we uh, move to receive the um, additional casino conditions? Councilor Marula. Just on the uh, location, we provided a map today. Um, and if, for maybe if Tim could just, because it's not that, uh, I guess it was short time period, but can you just explain this map to us? Because I notice um, it, it's kind of difficult to read, but if you can just give us a brief uh, synopsis of what it means, it would be greatly appreciated. Yeah, so while I'm, while I'm doing that, Mr. Mayor, I get Mr. Mallard to distribute another map that's just hot off the press today with respect to other areas of the city that permits commercial entertainment or a casino in conjunction with a hotel. And Paul can explain that. So we've done some digging around in terms of that definition. Thank you, sir. And it's allowed within our city regional parks, for example, including Confederation Park and, and Mohawk Park. So this map that was distributed earlier, Mr. Mayor, this is the downtown, the three downtown zones um, that currently permit um, commercial entertainment or casinos uh, as a matter of right. Um, and uh, that's a combination of the D1, D2, and D3 zones. You do see the West Harbor outlined in red as well. That does permit commercial or will permit commercial entertainment. We're waiting for the board order and the lifting of the interim control bylaw, but the basic uh, decisions were made on that. But the problem with that area is, and we own most of the land, is that a hotel is not permitted because of the settlement with CN in terms of vibration and noise. So anything residential related, such as a hotel, wasn't permitted. And Mr. Mayor, we're not on as staff for a freestanding casino, and I made that condition recommended before. It would have to be in conjunction with a, a mixed-use big hotel point of view. So what Paul uh, Mallard has just distributed, uh, Mr. Mayor, is the uh, areas of the city that allow commercial entertainment in conjunction with a hotel. So you'll see the business parks, which we zoned a couple years ago, um, and the perimeters of some of the other business parks, uh, like uh, Clappison's Corner um, and uh, the South Service Road, for example, allows hotels. Um, and the entire uh, West Hamilton Innovation District, so the McMaster now, Innovation Park, allows hotels. Now, on that point, Mr. Mayor, it's important. Mm -hmm. Would it be possible to attach a list or an index with respect to these locations separately? A, like a list of what? Like every address that's in this zone? Or no, this oh, map? Maybe just because, yeah, well, a description would be, yeah, a description would be helpful, actually, I think. Well, Mr. Mayor, we can pro provide more more detail map mapping Please. that yes. that focuses in on them by blocks or that's wonderful by wards that or actually, something. That actually would work. So you can actually read the streets and stuff. Right. We we can do that. Okay, thank you. Richard, did you someone else have a question? Okay. So no, I did. Yes. Go ahead, please. Um, so, actually, sorry, Mr. Mayor. We'll do that as part of the report that we're bringing back right. on the conditions and the urban design and the bill form and the economic. We'll have that all part of a report. That's probably going to be um, the first meeting in February. Right. I believe the point today is just to get to the point where you can work on that report. So go ahead. All right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And um, I'm just uh, uh, two clerks through you. 4.2, does that include uh, some of the conditions that Councillor Clark had indicated at our meeting the other day? Yes, 4.2 is a summary of Councillor Clark's um, concerns that he expressed. And so these, can, these items can be referred to staff for inclusion in the final report that they will be presenting in January. All right, thank you. Appreciate that. And who, uh, Councillor Pasuda? Thank you, Mayor Bertini. We're talking about locations, Mr. Mayor. Um, through to Norm, back when uh, OLG and Great Canadian Gaming, who owned the Flamborough Downs, Flamborough Casino site, 
were negotiating for a lease because OLG had to lease the property from Great Canadian Gaming in order for people to partake in the bidding for, for a site. Uh, has there been any, and, and without disclosing any personal stuff, has there uh, been any movement on a lease agreement between the owners of the Flamborough site and OLG? Three, Mr. Mayor, those negotiations, as I understand, uh, are still ongoing. So three, Mr. Mayor, to Norm then. So, and it's my understanding, because I've had conversations with, uh, with both of them uh, about the leasing, if, if OLG does not obtain a lease from Great Canadian Gaming, then the Flamborough site is off? Is that my understanding? Three, Mr. Mayor. Three, Mr. Mayor, yes. If, um, if OLG does not obtain a lease from Great Canadian Gaming uh, as of March 31st, they will not have a place to operate. So then, Mr. Mayor, uh, through you, then the only other option is another site somewhere in Hamilton based on what we have on this mapping before us. Is that correct? Uh, yes, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, through the process, yeah, yes, we can. We, uh, if we acknowledge uh, that a site would be deemed acceptable by, by council, and, uh, we could look at an alternative site for OLG for an interim location. So, Mr. Mayor, just to clarify, so it wouldn't happen overnight. So if we do one day, they can't get the lease. You won't see a casino popping up overnight. It's got to go through this new OLG process with support of council. Yes, I, I understand it. And, and so um, through Mr. Mayor to Norm then, is there a timeline, do we know, where they have to come to an agreement between the two, the two uh, parties? You, Mr. It, it, the deadline is March the 31st, so, but uh, I am going to be talking to Great Canadian Gaming this afternoon, so I will clarify the, uh, the situation. Okay. And uh, Mr. Mayor, I'd just like to say that uh, I, can, I can read. It says, no downtown Hamilton Casino. It's a good showing from the residents from downtown. That's great. I'm, I myself, uh, uh, you know, I'm a farmer. We have lots of farmers out there who participate in, in, the, in the horse racing industry, not only own race horses, but provide feed grains and, and uh, you know, hay straw and all of that, which I have done in my time. To me, it, it's imperative that we keep uh, and, and, and that they negotiate and through the process that we can keep Flamborough Downs and the casino there. It provides a lot of jobs as it is now and uh, it would be devastating for the rural community out there should we lose that uh, site out there. So, you know, being a farmer and being in that being my ward where the casino is and, and the racetrack, it's, it's a vital part of our community out there and looking forward to having it stay there. Thank you. So that's what we would call the MB attitude in my backyard. <laughs> we are we're certainly all of us uh, are hoping that we can find a way to sustain the agricultural component, certainly no question about it. So I have Councillor Whitehead and Councillor Partridge. Go ahead, Councillor. I uh, wanted to ask Tim, um, it, with this, this mapping, um, are we going to get any pros and cons each decide rel just relative to from a planning perspective? I'm not looking at the public health issues. I'm looking just from a planning perspective. Are we going to, can we get that information? Um, Mr. Mayor, I'm not sure what the question is in terms of what our opinion would be about a pref the, what we would feel as a preferred site or what? No, no, no. I, I don't want, I want, I'm just strictly from the lens of a planning perspective. Here are a number of areas that you've identified that uh, are, are zoned or will allow uh, casinos or multi-purpose uh, slash casino. Uh, I got to think that there's going to be uh, uh, sites that are more favorable based on um, from a planning perspective, so uh, that's the kind of uh, information you plan all the time. You provide to us all the time in planning, so looking for something similar. So, Mr. Mayor, this is based on fairly new recent policy. I mean, this zoning was just put in place a couple of years ago based on council's new policies about where council and the planning department felt it appropriate to have a hotel with ancillary uh, commercial entertainment, commercial recreation uses. So these are all appropriate sites, but you know, are they big enough? What's there? Do they have enough parking? What's the access? What's the traffic impact? Those would have to be looked at on a site site by site basis. Because so. I'm looking at one area here, and I believe that is uh, designated as employment lands. They're all employment lands except the green ones. Now the the, the blue ones, so employment lands. 
uh, I thought there was a limited footprint for the entertainment component. No. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Partridge. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And just uh, very quickly, um, uh, my question will be uh, to Tim, I think. Clamber Downs is uh, 100 acres. It's a very large piece of property. Now, within our downtown, and I'm not suggesting that we need to have 100 acres to, to put a casino, but can, can you provide an estimation of how large a site would be needed for a casino hotel combination? How many acres? Um, well, we could look at that as part of our city building. Um, obviously, we would not, as part of our, our conditions that we would recommend to you, that there certainly wouldn't be any surface parking. So it's all going to be underground or on a structured basis. So it would depend on if they go underground or structure, it would depend on the area, um, and depends on the number of rooms. Um, but you can build a fairly big development on uh, on uh, not too big of a property. We, when you look at these hotels across the street, so you could do it on an acre. Okay, acre, so that's two. what that's what I was looking yeah. for. Was it, you know, would two acres be? Yeah, two acres would probably be adequate. And where within the city of Hamilton do we have a two-acre site or more? To build the, that that would re, that would take a casino with a hotel yeah. or just a casino. Well, probably in a lot of those places that are zoned, uh, if you start knocking down buildings. All right. So there, it may require knocking down some buildings, but the the land is available, is what I'm hearing you say. Okay. Thank you. For uh, the assistance of, in terms of uh, acres in the downtown, what would the uh, footprint of the McMaster, the new facility, be there in terms of acreage? 3.5. 3.5. you agree with that? It's about... Oh, I don't know exactly, but I, uh, I would probably accept that. I think that sounds a little big, but uh, I'll, at least two, okay? So there's another half of that site, which would be the equivalent footprint. So, you know, you could build a... If it's two acres you need, you could do it in the other on the parking lot of, of the Ed Center, so to speak. So th that just to give you an idea of what an acre or two looks like in a in a dense urban context, because it's sometimes hard to figure that out. And I agree. So um, may I have a motion to refer the comments and four two to staff for inclusion in the report with respect to casino conditions? Whitehead and Basuda, all in favor? That's carried. Now, any questions with items uh, with uh, four point three, which is the timeline uh, template? Any questions on that? So if I could have a motion then to uh, receive this information. Councillor Partridge, Councillor Whitehead, all. are you going to second that? Norm, go ahead. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, we may have to revise the revised timeline given the reports that have come uh, been requested today. So we will come back again with another revised timeline to meet the, the deadlines. We, we've given ourselves a two-week two cushion to meet the OLG deadline, but um, with these uh, reports that have come forward today, we may have to... Uh, so for process, we're receiving this, but it may change. Correct. Okay. Move to receive. Partridge Whitehead, all in favor? That's carried. Uh, correspondence. The committee's uh, pleasure with respect to that correspondence. Receive it. Move by Whitehead. Partridge, all in favor? That's carried. Any further comments, Councillor Whitehead? Yeah, I'm sorry, I arrived a bit late. I don't see Mike Karpopoulos here, but we, we're talking about, again, converging... Um, the third being on the mountain by utilizing the utilization of technology. And I did talk to one of the providers last night and just to reaffirm that there'd be any issues and he said uh, absolutely not. Uh, and we could put out 60, 70, 80, 100,000 calls uh, in the city of Hamilton and have them participate in an interactive uh, uh, panel um, discussion. So can I just confirm that through the mayor to whoever might be able to answer that question? Three, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mike and I did discuss my cat to leave for another meeting, uh, but the vendor has been confirmed, and uh, that is correct. So the, we will be able to have that virtual component. So, so at this time, I, I don't know if I need to formally say that uh, now that we're taking that approach, I'm prepared to uh, converge the the, uh, the Mount meeting and the Lower City meeting as one meeting 
with the utilization of the virtual uh, town hall uh, technology. Excellent. So I'll formally move that at this point, Mr. Chair. Well, does or do I need to? No, no. Okay, very good. I think and that was captured in the uh, GIC. I appreciate that. Um, and I guess the other question, I think uh, uh, Councilor Partridge raised it again, is is this the appropriate site to, uh, to, to, to do this meeting or should we be looking at the convention center? Well, could we take that offline? We're, we're, we're not going to make that decision today. So, uh, anything else other than that? A motion to adjourn. Councilor Partridge, Pasuda, all in favor? That's carried. Thank you, everyone.